Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Baha'i Blogcast. This is a crazy conversation we're having with this one. It's a co-interview with me, Rain Wilson, and the founder of Baha'i Blog, Nesan Naragi. Now, how do you say that name? Because sometimes you say Naragi. You, you say it different. Naragi, yeah, so- Naragi. What's that sound? <laughs> So there's a letter in uh, the Persian alphabet bet called B. It's Wait, like say a, it again. It's called what? G. Uh, it's uh, like a yeah throatal G sound. It's called and, furball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so um, technically, Narag. My last name is Naragi, but because you know I was born in the states and my parents moved to the states in the '60s, it was um, the way Americans pronounced. The Q, which is the transliteration of that letter, is uh, K. So it's Naraki or Naraki or Naragi. Okay, good. One, one of these days I'm going to get a handle on Farsi, but this is, that's a good place to start. I am going to start with asking you a question because one of the things that I find really fascinating about you personally, uh, besides your ravishing good looks, is <laughs> uh, what a world citizen you are. Uh, tell the listening audience a little bit about uh, your history, where you were born, where you were lived, all the various continents. Okay, so um, my parents left Iran in 19, around 1967, and they got married in Chicago, uh, right outside the Baha'i Temple, actually. And um, I was born, along with all my sisters, in Chicago. And then when I was young, my parents moved to Papua New Guinea. It's a Pacific Island nation and um, kind of north of Australia, very different jungles covering mountains. It's a, you know, if you study anthropology, everybody learns about Papua New Guinea. It's a very untouched nation. And yeah, I guess I always considered myself a Persian American living in Papua New Guinea or being raised in Papua New Guinea. And since I left when I was 18, I've lived in 10 different countries, I think, and some of them repeatedly. Name them um, quick, go. Oh, uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, U.S., New Zealand, Israel, Australia, South Africa, um, England, East Timor. Wow, I mean, is that, yeah, that's crazy. I'm sure I'm missing some. So but, you were um, in when you say Israel, you were serving at the Baha'i Holy Land. Yes, that's correct. The International Center. What were you doing there? So I've served there three times over the space of ten years. Um, uh, just for people listening to this who don't know, like Baha'is, all the Baha'is in Israel are, vo- are volunteers. They go to serve at the Baha'i World Center in different capacities. There's beautiful gardens, so they work as gardeners or security guards or cleaners or secretaries, things like that. And so the first time I went, I was a cleaner, and it was amazing. It was probably the best year of my life. I was 19, a lot of fun. You go for a year, um, you get provided with like food and accommodation, and then you just basically work. And that was great. And then the second two times I was there was to do with uh, media and uh, video projects. Nice. And why did you found Baha'i Blog? What's the origin of uh, your fantastic website and online community you you founded? Thanks, Rain. Um, yeah, so Baha'i Blog basically started out of the need to have a strong presence or at least just a presence online. The state of the faith online was pretty bad like you'd look up the baha'i faith and there'd be these really old 1980s websites or every link was broken or you'd look up subjects you couldn't find anything and then even now you it's funny you'll google baha'i faith or something like that and it'll be like the baha'i website of the baha'is of charleston south carolina and for some reason it'll come into like the top 10 or 15 (laughs) search results Um, plus a lot of Covenant Breaker websites and, and, and whatnot. Crazies. Yeah, unfortunately, like, 
the space online is often somewhere where if a lot of people have an axe to grind, they go online. And so a lot of the things you find online are kind of a few of the crazies out there. So they think they're, you know, um, you know, they think they're the return of the prophet of the faith, Baha'u'llah, or things like that. There's some crazy stuff out there. And also, I think because a lot of Baha'is don't want to create conflict and kind of uh, engage in those conversations, they step back and they neglect it, which is, you know, comes from a good place. But the sad result of that is that the kind of stuff that raise, you know, comes to the forefront of the online search is all this kind of crazy stuff. And, and it's not just the crazy stuff, it's just a lack of information. So about five years ago, I got together with a couple of really close friends that I grew up with in Papua New Guinea, Kalis Taid, who is the CEO of Envato and co-founder of the company Envato. Um, Kalis, his wife, Cyan, and then their father, Fod, who's like a dad to me. I grew up with him, he used to take me to school in Papua New Guinea. Um, the three of us, um, basically got together and started Baha'i Blog. And the aim was really not only to raise the profile of the faith online, but to also really celebrate the faith because the faith is so dynamic and there's so many cool things about the Baha'i faith that as Baha'is we're constantly discovering and exploring. And I think it was really just to kind of like celebrate this, you know, rich, uh, dynamic tapestry uh, that the revelation of Baha'u'llah has, and also to celebrate all the cool initiatives and Baha'is that are doing things around the world. Everything from like somebody who writes a cool Baha'i book, or somebody who's put some of the Baha'i writings to music and released an album. There needed to be a space where people could hear about this stuff, and so that's kind of what we've been doing, and so far it's been really popular. Well, I one of the main things I love about the Baha'i faith is it really feels like a world community. And no matter what country you go to, there are Baha'is there and they're loving and in service and in worship and in, in really some really cool and interesting ways. And you've created a little microcosm of the Baha'i world community on a website, which for me, you know, learning about it and getting to know the site and being a big fan of it, it's uh, it's really a service to the Baha'is, um, most of all. I know it has a bit wider audience, but it's mostly for Baha'is, and I think it's just a great service for Baha'is to remind us that, hey, we're world citizens, and there are Baha'is working for the cause of Baha'u'llah and uplifting people and making arts and, and doing service all over the world, and you're a part of that global community. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, really, I'm always blown away. You know, I travel quite a lot, and I catch up with Baha'is all over the world. And I'm always blown away by how many amazing and dynamic Baha'is there are around the world. And like, they're just such fascinating stories. Like you just sit in a room with someone and, you know, you just see them and you think, oh, who's this guy? And then you just find out like this guy, you know, was born in Japan, raised Do you have any in examples this about this? Of this? Oh, God. I mean, there's literally most Baha'is you talk to have some crazy kind of like stories about where they lived, where they're from, what language they speak. You know, I mean, even just, um, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Nima, like he was, you know, he's Persian descent, uh, raised in Japan up to the age of 12, then grew up in Canada, now lives in Australia. You know, you'll be in a restaurant with him. You see this guy, he looks like a Persian dude, and then he's like, you know, in a Japanese restaurant, he busts out, you know, Japanese speaking fluently to the uh, waiters and waitresses, and they're always shocked. So it's kind of like one of those things where it's quite common. And and when you're with friends that aren't Baha'i, often they're like, man, like, Baha'is are really interesting people. And I think it's because a lot of us have been raised with this kind of concept of, like, nation borders aren't as important. It's more about the, you know, the world of humanity that we're yeah. all trying to be part of. I just saw a, uh, a TED Talk the other day that just came out, and this guy was just talking uh, on, a, on TED Talks. He said, I'm a world citizen, and we need to be world citizens. And, yeah. uh, and it was so interesting to see the, you know, the revelation of Baha'u'llah coming out through someone who was not a Baha'i and just talking about how you know, the, the normal barriers and boundaries and borders, they just don't hold water anymore. We're every, doing everything on a global scale at this point. Yeah, and we're seeing that more and more with things like the refugee crisis happening around the world or even, you know, the environment. Like what somebody does in one country affects yeah. a country on the other side of the planet. So it's kind of like, and there's this definitely, there's definitely a shift in the world towards this concept of world unity and world citizenship. Having said that, though, a lot of people, 
you know, often tell me, oh, yeah, but, you know, does that mean that all cultures are going to melt away? And I think like something, you know, that the Baha'i writings are, you know, talk about is the fact that we have to, you know, these cultures are preserved and maintained and we celebrate, you know, there's a quote which says unity and diversity and that kind of concept is celebrated in the faith where we celebrate uh, the different languages and the different cultures, but they all just get along and that's the key, you know, if something is going to exist at the you know expense of others then maybe it's not worth doing it and where would you like to see Baha'i blog go in the future do you have any big plans for you yeah I think like one of the things is just to make sure that it's uh, sustainable like financially sustainable and that it keeps going I don't I like believe getting you're pitching our first blog cast <laughs> audience for money we're, no. we're, we're 10 minutes into this thing you're already asking for funds That's, right now it's being funded Pathetic. by private individuals um, and it's you know it's something that like unfortunately there's no money in Baha'i stuff we just don't have that large a population and um, you know Baha'is want to contribute to a lot of other really good causes and the Baha'i funds which you know help the Baha'i activities around the world which is important but it is it is an interesting thing to try and figure that out, but I, I would, I just really want things to be not only, you know, self-sufficient, but um, there's something to be said for finishing what you start. And I hate starting projects that I can't finish. So I want to see Baha'i Blog blossom into this thing where there's a team of people that are not just volunteers that can keep doing this, you know, for generations to come. Yeah, so or as long as the internet exists, at least. <laughs> What's that great? There's a great quote from a hand of the cause who knew Baha'u'llah and he talked about the four qualities that Baha'u'llah liked the most in people. Yeah, that's and, right. And one of them was inability to, when you begin a project, to follow it through to the end. Yeah, uh, correct. Which is a, a very surprising thing to hear from the most recent manifestation of God on earth. But it really, uh, it really makes a lot of sense. I feel that same way. I always... I want to. I really want to strive to finish something that that I start. It was that way yeah. with Soul Pancake when when we started it and went through various iterations uh, uh, of it as a website. And there were so many times we wanted to throw in the towel, and I'm so glad that we didn't, and that we kept going. That we uh, are a media company now. It used to be a website, now a media company with a mission to provide uplifting. Uh, and unifying and challenging entertainment. And We're 12 minutes into this rain, and now you're giving a pitch about Soul Pink. <laughs> <laughs> so visit Soul Pink. No, I love Soul Pink. I, I love it. I love it. No, but just on that subject of the, you know, finishing what you start, I feel that's something that eats away at me. It's like one of my personal pet peeves. And I feel like, and this is not one of these things about, where I'm shaking my head and like, oh, this generation today is, you know, but really I find more and more people nowadays are, they just so easily throw the towel in. And it's whether it's um, a project they've started, friendships, marriage, jobs, they just, there's a sense, there's a total lack of commitment, which really <laughs> frustrates me. And I, I really value people like yourself, for example, that value this concept of finishing what you start. Well, you know, Abdul Baha talks about raising children to become accom uh, accustomed to hardship, right? And then recent studies have shown that one of the best determiners for the success of a child is grit and determination and overcoming adversity. And I do feel like uh, in contemporary society, adversity and difficulty and trouble means give up. Uh, as opposed to mm. persevere. So determination, yeah. perseverance, these, as we know, are, are spiritual virtues that can be taught. And um, that it's, it's really crucial because anything that can and will uh, and should transform lives is usually even really difficult. And it's re usually really hard. And there's usually a lot of obstacles thrown in the way. And it's mm. just going to take some grit and determination and perseverance and a lot of um, being accustomed to hardship. Yeah, and on that note, uh, Rain, I remember one of the once when I was in LA and we were talking, you were saying how you're about to go to Haiti and you're taking your son with you. And I remember asking you, 
oh, that's going to be interesting. Has he gone yet? And you're like, no, this is the first time. And I'm really excited about taking him because I want him to see how the rest of the world lives, you know? And I was like, yeah, that is awesome because I, I think that is one of the best um, educations anybody can have. I used to be so angry with my parents for moving to Papua New Guinea when I was quite young just because of the kind of contrast of I was a spoiled little brat in Chicago playing with my Legos to suddenly being in this country, you know, that was, comp- you know, third world for, you know, or the developing world or whatever you want to call it with a lot of poverty and hardship and um, difficulty. And I think that's kudos to you for doing that. I'd actually like to ask you a little bit about what you guys are doing in Haiti. I think that's awesome. Do you mind talking about that a bit? Um, I can certainly talk about that. Um, But I will say that one of the weirdest experiences I ever had was on one of my first trips to Haiti. I've been now about 12 times. But on one of the first trips I took, my wife and I needed to get back for Halloween so we could go trick-or-treating with Walter, who was around eight at the time. And we flew back in from Port-au-Prince to Los Angeles on Halloween itself, landed at LAX, came home just in time for dusk to go trick-or-treating. And we went to this really rich neighborhood in Calabasas, California. And we had just come from a week or so in Haiti. And then we were strolling around a neighborhood where there were buckets and buckets and garbage cans filled with candy. And they were giving, kids were saying, no, don't go to that house. They give little candy bars. If you go to that house, you get full-sized candy bars. And, uh... Just all of these kids in these incredibly expensive outfits and hauling around enormous sacks of uh, more candy than kids in Haiti would ever see in a lifetime. It was a real. Wow. Uh, it was a real education. But yeah, my uh, my wife and I uh, really fell in love with Haiti after we visited, um, along with the Mona Foundation, uh, several of the schools down there. There's a couple of Baha'i inspired schools the Anna Zanuzzi School and the George Marcellus School. And we visited them, really fell in love with the country, and we knew we wanted to do something down there. Then there was the earthquake. Um, So, you know, and we volunteered after the earthquake to go teach arts programs to uh, adolescent girls living in the tent camps. And uh, I was very skeptical. I was thinking, like, why are we teaching, you know, painting and drawing and creative writing and acting to girls that need jobs and they need shoes and roofs Um, Mm. but the transformative effect was astonishing and uh, this one little girl said to my wife and and this really kind of put a pin in what we're trying to do at Lide, it's our organization it's called Lide, she said she goes, oh I get it, other organizations come and they give us shoes and they give us food but you give us hope Wow, that's what we're aiming for. So we do literacy and arts programming for at-risk adolescent girls who live in rural Haiti, uh, very far out from the capital of Port-au-Prince. We go to places where there really are no other uh, nonprofits uh, within hundreds of miles. And um, we give scholarships as well. We do after-school tutoring and uh, school placement and, you know, we end up doing a lot of other things too, health and, and stuff like that. So we're in about eight different locations in Haiti, uh, serving almost 500 girls through this work. Wow. We have a mostly uh, entirely Haitian staff. Um, and it's really, we have an American executive director, but it's really Haitian run uh, from soup to nuts. So it's what? it's been really uh, gratifying to be a part of it. Why did you guys choose to focus on on girls? What was the? Well, this is a big uh, movement in the contemporary um, uh, world of education, which is the greatest transformative effect you can have is by educating girls, and that's to eliminate poverty and to transform community. And of course, we know this in the Baha'i faith when the education of women and girls is. Uh, Universal education is so highly prized. The education of women and girls is so highly prized. The arts are so highly prized. So it really is a Baha'i-inspired um, initiative. But it's, you know, like in everything that Baha'u'llah teaches and brings is um, very practical and mm-hmm. is being proven to be true. Um, 
kind of number yeah, of I different know, levels. I know a lot of people get surprised when I talk about that when you know in the Baha'i writings it says if you have a boy and a girl and you can only edu- you can only afford to educate one of them you should always educate the girl and a lot of people are surprised by that but that's like now like you're saying international standard policy isn't it I think the UN has adopted that as their mandate under UNICEF and things like that so yeah that's um yeah how long has Lida been going about 3 years 3 and a half years right now okay great yeah. So you, you, you still go to Haiti regularly? and We do go to Haiti regularly, although um, sadly enough, uh, I find that our best use of our time is really raising money and resources and teachers and volunteers here from the States. So right. it's not necessarily the best thing for my wife Holiday and I to fly down to Haiti at the cost of several thousand dollars just to, for us to teach. It's better for us to find some amazing Haitian-American creative writers and get them the money to go down and, and teach and volunteer and work with the girls and uh, to work on it from this end. What's uh, What was your son's experience like, actually? Do you mind sharing that? Like, how was, yeah, well, he's, I, been, he's been three times. The first time he went, he was nine, which is a little young. And we stayed at a kind of a nicer beach resort. So he didn't really see, I mean, he definitely saw some poverty and a lot of chickens and pigs and stuff like that, but he didn't really see it. But it wasn't until, you know, we rent a house uh, down there in Gonaive, Haiti, in in the north. And uh, really the last time he went down, kind of when he was 11, his Mm -hmm. his eyes really uh, opened to the incredible poverty and to what exactly was going on, the difference between his school and their school and how the kids dress and just the fact that kids don't have shoes. And, you know, we have many, many girls in our program who have never, never in their lives had breakfast. Right. So that's a, that's a level of poverty that's, you know, I've been to some poor places before in my travels. I've been, I lived as a kid in Nicaragua and, you know, I've been to El Salvador and Guatemala and Morocco and Turkey and, you know, I've seen poor places, but nothing like, but nothing like Haiti. But um, we just love the people or incredible spirit and the Baha'i community on there is just wonderful. I I am really inspired meeting the Baha'is that have been down there for 20, 30, 40 years and have just sacrificed their ease and comfort to um, uplift and serve the people of Haiti and the Baha'i community Mm -hmm. in Haiti. Um, it's they're incredible souls and incredible stories. Wow. What's, um, what's something rain changing the subject a little bit? Sorry, that was, um, what's something that like, Right. You know, as Baha'is, I think we're always thinking about different things. We're always trying to kind of like better ourselves and reflect on um, our conduct and our attitude towards things. What's something for you or at least right now in your life that you're kind of like really working on or thinking a lot about? Like what's something that's been on your mind right now? Um, well, that's a good hard-hitting question <laughs> yeah i we just did ruhi book five uh, my wife and i and a group of people out here in, in suburban los angeles and i really love that idea of the twofold moral purpose um which is presented so clearly in that book the our moral purpose to make the world a better place but also to make ourselves better people so mm. i guess that that's my challenge um i have um uh I've been an egotistical jerk for a huge portion of my life and um, trying to um, fight with my own self and my own ego. Um, uh, Do you think that... that The insistent self, Satan, or as as we know, uh, Abdu'l-Bahá referred to Satan. When asked what Satan was in the the view of the Baha'is, uh, by a reporter, he said, the insistent self. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess it's a daily battle with my insistent self. Um, and I guess what I'm mainly, my main struggle is how do I bring um, the teachings and daily reading of the teachings, prayer, daily prayer, and daily, daily meditation to bear those spiritual forces? How do I bring them to bear in a disciplined way in my life, in a, in a on a daily basis. 
Mm. So it's very easy for me to let those things slip and just do the minimum. Like, oh, I'll just mm. read one sentence of a, I'll read the shortest hidden word I can find by my bedside table, you know, right. in the morning or, and in the evening. And then I'll kind of breeze my way through the short obligatory prayer. And um, I would like to uh, be much more engaged with those spiritual tools that we all need in our spiritual tool belt, prayer, meditation, and reading and studying the Holy Word. Mm. You know, I was, it's funny because I, I think a lot of people, when they think of Hollywood and, you know, you're an actor, you're well known, you have a lot of eyes on you and people kind of look at a lot of tabloids and they think of Hollywood as this kind of crazy, like, you know, it's a lot of it is about the individual and a lot of bling bling and things like that. And I always, when I was here a few weeks ago and we're on a set, you know, you're doing, you're filming something on a set and we're meeting and you introduced me to the director and a lot of the staff, I was blown away by how nice everyone was and how like people were so gracious and so friendly. And I, is that um, like this concept of Hollywood, is that a myth? Is that like, is that hard as a Baha'i, do you think, to navigate through that world? Or is everybody just really nice and that's all a show? Like that's something that I think a lot of people wonder about. I always used to wonder about that, you know? like. Well, I think that's a... I- I, I wrote a book that came out last year, The Bassoon King, and I talk a little bit about that. In Another there. commercial. I know. Right? I got a plug. I've got a plug. I can't help it. I'm wired. It's a great. It's a great book, actually. I love I'm, that. I'm book. wired for self promotion. The um, I'm sorry you had to hear all these this shameless plugging people. Our audience of 17 people who are listening. No, but I honestly, I can vouch for it. it's a great book. Okay, if anybody that's has enough. a chance, shut okay. it. Shut it, Nissan. Um, Zip it. Uh, the there's a you know there's a misconception of Hollywood as uh, venal materialistic backstabbing uh, corrupt um, and certainly there are those aspects if you just read the um, the tabloids and kind of what's happening with kind of the very worst of Hollywood then that's the impression that you're going to get my experience is by and large working actors writers producers directors and crew people are really family people who want to make high quality entertainment and they're very creative and accessible and open to spirituality. Uh, Maybe not to belonging to an organized, quote unquote, organized religion. They may Mm. want to find spirituality through, you know, going to a yoga class or reading an Eckhart Tolle book or getting a meditation of the day sent to them on an app or something like that. They don't, you know, want to join something, but Mm -hmm. people are, um, I, I've worked with really mostly very, very good people. Um, yeah. Do, do a lot of people, I mean, I'm sure a lot of them know that you're Baha'i. Do they ask a lot about it? Do they think it's weird? Do they avoid, like, are people open to talking about these things here? Like, are they happy to ask you about it or do they think they don't want to pry? Or well, People are generally very open to talking about spirituality or discussions of, of life's bigger questions and God and free will and purpose and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, but, you know, do they ask specifically about the Baha'i faith? No. Um, right. do, do their eyes glaze over when you start to, you know, give them the bullet points of what the Baha'i faith is? Sure. But that's yeah. kind of the same with everyone these days. I, I find yeah. in, you know, in secular uh, Western culture it is, at least, where where I have the most experience in talking to people. They're just not that open to hearing about organized religion because on people's minds, I feel like they think that an organized religion is the problem, not the solution. That's kind of the last mm-hmm. place where anyone would think to turn for answers to the world's problems. So it may take a little while before that attitude shifts when the world's problems get so heated that people go... Oh, maybe we threw the baby out with the bathwater by discarding mm. the possibility that faith or religion or devotion uh, could be an asset to helping move humanity forward. Yeah, and you can't really blame people, though, for that. I mean, you look at what's happening around the world and that concept of organized religion, as we see it today, is quite, you know, divisive. So you can't. So let me throw it back to you. What's something that's been mm. on your mind a lot recently when it comes to the faith? What excites you about the faith mm. right now in your life or what challenges do you have in terms of you being a, 
a Baha'i, making your mm. way between back and forth between America and Australia and doing Baha'i blog as a, as a part-time service? Um, lately, I mean, you know, it's, it's a constantly, it's a moving, you know, there's just the faith is so dynamic, but lately the thing that's been really pressing on my mind is this concept of creating a culture of encouragement or just this concept of encouragement. I think, um, that's been, I don't know, that's just been something, you know, there's, you know, haters are going to hate. And I'm always thinking about, man, like, am I, you know, I've had, I get a lot of people, pitching ideas to me about different things to do with do Baha'i projects. Do you mean a culture of encouragement in the Baha'i community itself? Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm talking more within the Baha'i faith. I mean, I think it depends on the society and the culture you're in. Like, um, I mean, I absolutely love Australia, for example, but there is also this concept of tall poppy syndrome, which, you know, somebody has a good idea and a lot of people try and cut it down. And if, I mean, I, I think that's slowly changing. Um, and I will don't say get me that that does that is certainly not the case in the United States. Um, yeah, I think is, there is a there are so many um, cultural, deep, deep cultural flaws with this nation, but there is not a tall poppy syndrome in the United States. If someone has a strong idea or passion and wants to think outside the box and try something outrageous. Uh, they're applauded and saluted usually mm. I find but that does lead to the opposite extreme which is just a culture of individualism where right. uh, it's a bunch of cowboys going at it on their own and not in community and not in collaboration yeah. and consultation yeah I think that's that's something like I, I just I don't know I keep thinking because I have people pitching different ideas to me all the time or things like Baha'i blog I'm trying to not be so sensitive and also you know like a lot of people will ask for your advice or your opinion on something and i realize a lot of times because i'm very busy i just like you know i just give them my opinion on it and i realize that you know it's like you know people put their heart and soul into things and it's just one of those things where you're not going to get anywhere by discouraging people and often we kind of um we hope that I don't know. I just think we have to let go and let people figure. But at figure... the same time, Nissan, don't you think that people can waste a lot of time? Like if you don't give them your honest opinion about, they say, I want to do a creative project with, you know, photographs of different people's prayer book covers. Yeah. And I'm going to spend a yeah. year doing that. And you, yeah. and if you don't kind of yeah. say, hey, maybe you should take all that passion and creativity and put it towards something a little more useful yeah i guess that's they the can dilemma. waste a that's... lot of they can waste a lot of time yeah you know? maybe there's higher priorities you're right i think i think it depends who you're talking to but this is the thing i'm always thinking about like to what extent do you you know make mention of something like that i mean one is the way in which you say it you know in the baha'i writings we're told we have to use words as mild as milk and i think often i can be very just like you know point form like boom 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 um but i also think you know, maybe if that's the person's passion and that's really what they want to do, take photos of buyer prayer books around the world, let them scratch that itch, let them do that, and then let them figure out that maybe they could have spent their time more wisely. But I wonder if, like, putting that idea down is necessarily going to, you know, help them in the long run. I think we're in life, you know, life is a marathon, not a sprint. And like, maybe they need to do something like that in order to have a self realization that they could have put their time into something else. Um, so I don't know, I guess it's just something I'm constantly thinking about. And I feel like I can be quite harsh. And my mom is always saying even the way I speak is very harsh. And she's my mom. And she's always like, why are you so angry? And I'm like, I'm not angry, mom. Why are you saying I'm angry? She's like, there you go again. You're angry. And I'm like, I'm not angry. And I think I don't know my own voice. Like my voice can sound kind of harsh. And I'm always like, I forget. And I, I think I've, I, I know I've made a few people cry just like without meaning to like over a cup of coffee, then telling me an idea. And I say a few things and. I was like, oh my god! I, you know, I still lose sleep over those conversations. And if uh, if anyone is listening to this and want to write into Baha'i Blog, if if Nasan has ever made you cry, we'd love <laughs> to hear from you. 
Um, you will get yeah my inbox will get uh full of things but i would like to apologize to all those people out there that i've you know maybe you know been discouraging to i think that's something i've been really trying to work on and trying to be a lot more encouraging like let people find their own you know expression of creativity I and their find own you to be like a big beautiful persian bahai teddy bear <laughs> and i don't I don't know how anyone could ever be offended at anything you say. But let's, um, uh, you know, so, since you're a Baha'i world citizen and so well-traveled, uh, I know you go to Europe a ton and, and, mm. and New Guinea and you've been all over, you've been to Africa. And um, what's, give us some good news from the front out there. What's, where are some really exciting places that you've been and where you've seen some, some really exciting stuff happening in, in Baha'i mm. communities? I think okay. News I mean, from the front. News from the front. I mean, there's. The, I think the cool thing about the community, a Baha'i community around the world, is everyone is trying. Like everybody's doing stuff, and the Universal House of Justice expresses that it's important for us to read our reality, and based on that, we have to you know take action according to our reality and people's realities are in different places. And I used to compare a lot of places with each other, like Papua New Guinea, for example. We have, you know, I don't know, something like 150,000 Baha'is. It's like 1% of the population of the nation is Baha'i. And it's like it's like such an active, vibrant, amazing, dedicated community. And then I'd go somewhere, you know, like I have family in Sweden, and we'd go to feast. And, you know, a feast in where I lived in Papua New Guinea was like 300 people. And in Sweden, it was like six people, if we were lucky. And five of the six were my family. So it was like, <laughs> oh, man, you know, like just such a contrast. But, you know, like everybody's challenges and things are so different. So I don't compare things so much anymore. But I will say, like, recently I was in Spain and in the uh, area of Malaga, for example. And one thing I've noticed um, in, in communities that are, quote, unquote, successful is that they actually are doing a wide variety of different uh, activities. You know, they're doing the four core activities. They're doing, like, for example, devotionals and junior youth groups and children's classes and study circles. But they're also having, like, monthly picnics with everyone and um, deepening classes on different topics and studying, you know, like in this community I visited in Spain, in, in the south of Spain, they were study. they had, like, uh, classes on the Bible and, you know, Christianity and the Baha'i faith. Um, and they would have regular meetings and... There was kind of, I think there's like, there was more interaction. I think like a lot of Baha'i communities have been very insular in some way. And the, the, basically the direction from the House of Justice for the longest time has been that we need to start focusing outward. And I think the coolest things are coming out of countries that are really not seeing these false dichotomies or not these lines. When I was in Nepal, we went to a cluster reflection meeting and this is like, for those of you who don't know, a reflection meeting is where like a area, like a group of villages or a city or a town comes together to discuss um, the affairs of that community and what's going on and how they want to plan to move forward. And I think there was like, this is like kind of, th this was during the time of the civil war when the Maoists had basically, you know, surrounded the capital, the two ca main cities. And we we're in this village and there was like three, 400 people there. And there was, you know, the friend was like, do you know how many people here are Baha'i? I was like, no. And he was like, four. You know, out of 400 people, there was only four Baha'is. Everybody, the, all these communities were coming together at this reflection meeting to reflect on their reality, to look at their community, mm. to see where things were at and what they needed to do to move forward. And these are meetings that are held around the Baha'i world every three months. Um, you know, they, they plan act and reflect plan act and reflect and to me those are like exciting things where you see there's you know 400 people and just a few of them are baha'is and you know they built a school for their kids there they realized that there was high illiteracy amongst women so they started uh, literacy classes for women and this was born out of the community itself and i think that's the those are the exciting things or like the community in Spain I was talking about. They're like studying things that are relevant to their reality. Like people are Catholics and they want to learn more about, you know, the Catholic faith and the Baha'i faith. And so they've got classes for that. And I just think that's kind of, those are kind of the exciting things. There's so many cool and dynamic things happening. I was just in Peru. My sister and her family uh, lived in Peru for a few years. They just left. And, 
I mean, that was an, um, you know, not a huge community, but an amazing community where people were doing things together and just really like, you know, Peru, you know, Latin America generally, they love to spend time together. They, they, you know, they're up all night. It's like, God, don't you guys work the next day? But, you know, everybody's up all night. But it's just like the spirit of friendship and fellowship. I think those are kind of some of the cool, exciting things. But everybody in the Baha'i world is really focused on the directives from the Universal House of Justice and really just trying to, you know, put those into action and implement them. And I think that to me is exciting. Like whatever the result is, it's not as important as the fact that everyone's trying. Great. Sorry, I went on for too long. No, that's great. <laughs> this is, this is I, want, I wanted to ask you, Rain, about your, you know, like, You've often said that, you know, like you were an actor and you're living in New York and you're doing stuff. And I wanted to know what your like aha moment was as far as the faith is concerned. And um, like, I, like, did you like because your family was Baha'i, but then do you like did you leave the Baha'i faith and then come back? Or were you always like a Baha'i, but then you just kind of felt like you know, you just weren't like busy and active in Baha'i activities. And, and what made, like, where did the coin drop? Like what made you kind of get back into things? Well, apologies to listeners that have heard me tell this story before, because I have told it on a Millions number of, of different times. occasions. But yeah, uh, a, long, a very long story short is I actively left the Baha'i faith when I was about 20, 21 years old and uh, had moved to New York City to become an actor. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this. One was rebellion against my parents. One was I didn't want morality hanging over my head. You know, mm. I wanted to be able to have sex and drink and do drugs if I wanted, and I didn't want this idea of morality. Uh, I wanted to live the bohemian lifestyle, and I didn't want anything to get in the way of that. Mm. And I just wanted to be an artist. So I really jettisoned not only the Baha'i faith, but God and the idea of God and, and prayer and faith and devotion and um, just really embraced the kind of secular bohemian world of downtown New York City in the late 80s and early, early 90s. And, um, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's in my book. It's in kind of longer interviews that I've done before. But basically, long story short was... You know, a few years later, here I was working as an actor, and I was with my wife at the time. Um, we were a boyfriend girlfriend, and and she was delightful and, and wonderful. And so I, I was had I was living beyond my wildest dreams, and yet found myself to be very unhappy. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't put my finger on it. It's like, why am I unhappy? I'm working as an actor. I have an awesome <laughs> apartment in New York City, and I'm. I have great friends and making art and I've got an awesome woman by my side and why am I so kind of lost feeling and that kind of led me to a long um, reinvestigation of the idea of faith and wondering if I did believe in God if I could believe in God because it all starts there it all starts with is there a creator is there a divine creator or not we're either a random assemblage of molecules that gained consciousness or uh, there is some divine uh, creative force behind everything, the physical world and the material world and as well as the spiritual uh, world. So what, that, was, that was a long investigation. But really, you know, when you boil it all down to it, you know, as soon as you asked me that question, I was trying to pinpoint it because this podcast is a little bit more for a Baha'i audience. Mm. I um, I needed to reread the holy books. I say reread. I never read the holy books growing up. Mm. You just, as a Baha'i kid growing up in the Baha'i faith, you, you get like a little bird. You get little stuff, like chunks of worm kind of handed to you from your parents. It's when I started reading the holy texts. And the first one I started with was the Dawnbreakers. Mm. And I remember reading the Dawnbreakers over four days, over a Thanksgiving break. That's a thick book too. That's that is, not a joke. A huge With all the names in there, how did you remember? That? I, actually, you've got to read it quickly because otherwise, yeah, you start. I just, I didn't. Names. Everyone is Hassan Ali Muhammad. Yeah, <laughs> some version of of that, Mirza something, and um, 
But it was really inspiring to me to read uh, the stories of the early uh, days of the cause and the the stories of the early martyrs of the Baha'i faith, the sacrifices that those people made, the vital and rich history that our faith had in Persia in the mid-1800s. Mm. And it kind of kindled in my heart uh, an affinity for those people and what they went through. And I found myself kind of on a similar journey. I'm on a journey, you know, just like they were on a journey. They They may have had swords and were defending their lives and had muskets and horses and it's a little bit different <laughs> you know mm. in, in modern life but that started me uh reading i you know i read the the four-part uh, biography of baha'u'llah by Teher a day and read the kitab gone and gleanings and the epistle to the son of the wolf and the other major books and kind of then i had my own experience with my faith uh, that wasn't my parents experience it wasn't my experience from growing up it was it became my story um, mm. and uh, it became part of who I was. And I, so I had an ownership and that was kind of my aha moment that started was, me back. Was that, was that like a difficult transition for you? Like, were you so like, did you do things incrementally? Like you're, if you went from this kind of like crazy lifestyle, did you just suddenly like stop everything or were you just kind of like step by step? Like, you know what? I, or like, you know what I mean? Like, was it just kind of like a bang? This is who I am now. Yeah. Well, it, I had stopped doing drugs. That was just a very short chapter of my life. Um, and it, it helped me quit drinking alcohol, um, which was a big part of my life through my 20s. And, um, but more importantly than that, um, it kind of gave my, it gave my life purpose again. So mm. here I was, I'm an actor and an artist, and that was always my dream, and I'm doing that, but yet I was unhappy. And I really found the source of my unhappiness really was myself all of mm. that focus and putting on to myself and me and my career and and you know when you put yourself at the center uh you know it, it seems contrary um in contemporary society but it can make you very unhappy so when i started mm. looking at spirituality in a broader context and like oh being an and the quotes of Abdul Baha and being an artist and the important of the importance of the role of the artist, of the storyteller, of the actor transforming into characters and telling stories, um, enlightening and using incredible language. Um, it became much more exciting when I thought about art as service. Um, things, pieces started to fall into place for me. Did it that... took many years. It took many, many years. And there were right. many great teachers uh, along the way, um, a lot of missteps, a lot of issues. It wasn't like all of a sudden it was like this, you know, pink pink cloud. Uh, right. It was. Uh, it was. It has been a very long process. This this whole process that I'm describing has happened over the last like sixteen to nineteen years. So it's been right. It's been a while. Has that uh, does that has that affected you like as you deepen in the Baha'i writings and things like that? Does that affect, for example, the scripts that you're given that you look at or the roles you choose to play or like as a actor that must be is that a difficult world to navigate as well? Yeah, it's it's um, it's certainly challenging. I have definitely turned down roles and parts and projects that I found to just be morally reprehensible. Mm. And I've said this before at Baha'i talks, but. I've definitely taken roles that are morally dubious. <laughs> you know, mm. if I feel like there's a, uh, uh, a good message at the heart of uh, what it is of the story that I'm a part of, I also really am a big fan of very dark stories and think that they can be very, um, they can be extremely um, enlightening. That I think there's a idea in the Baha'i faith that, oh, Baha'is can only do kind of heartwarming stories and mm. I think sometimes it's the darkest stories of all that reveal the most about humanity you know mm. um, I think I don't know just something that popped in my mind is Schindler's List you know right that's showing the extremity of of human moral questions from the 
the best of humanity to the worst of humanity and it's a very dark and disturbing film but I'm so glad it was made and it's a mm. it's a great and important story and Baha'is can be telling stories like that we don't have to just be telling stories about interracial couples um, right holding hands holding hands Kumbaya. and <laughs> eating ice cream and, and handing out food to poor people or something like that and uh, so the Yeah, you know, that, it's it's really helped put things in perspective. Mm. What are you reading? Anything right now? Is there a book you're reading right now? A Baha'i book that you're just really into? Yeah, I'm reading the biography of George Townsend. Oh wow! Um, I forget who wrote it, but um, it's a little dry. It's a little long. <laughs> he gives. I mean, he goes into the minutia of like, and then George right. Townsend bought three dozen eggs that morning, and. And he wrote a letter to Shoghi Effendi saying thusly, you know. Right. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I didn't know anything about him. And it's a, it's a fascinating story to hear this. In fact, it would be a great movie someday of oh, maybe, yeah. few, maybe in the future in the Baha'i world about what it was a, one, someone really high up in the Christian ministry who's kind of a, a closet Baha'i and wondering right. how to come out of the closet, so to speak. <laughs> and it really tormented him and was really difficult. And he couldn't just quit because he had to support his family and he had these financial obligations to his family that was really dependent on him. And, you know, Ireland was poor at the time. Mm. So, uh, but he had a fascinating life. He, I, I had no idea he lived in the United States for, I don't know, what is it, eight or 10 years and traveled all around, lived in out in Utah and uh, in Tennessee and hiked and camped. And he was this rugged outdoorsman as well as a mm. poet and philosopher and, and student of the faith and, and early Baha'i. It's interesting what you're saying about the book being a little bit dry, though, because I always think about this because on the one hand, like these books are so important because they're capturing the history of the faith. And I remember something that Mr. Tarzada said um, at a talk once. Um, he was saying that basically we don't have stories. This is the history. And I interviewed um, May Faizi about the book she wrote about her father, Hand of the Cause, Mr. Faizi. And one of the things she said as well was that, you know, it was very important when she wrote that book to make sure that she didn't embellish things, to make sure that she got the facts right and cross-check things because this is the history of the faith and she wanted to represent it because this is that book is going to stick around and historians in the future will be looking at things like that. And I always wonder about that as well. I, I wanted to, um, I've started kind of like gathering research about a book about my father and my mother and they're, you know, pioneering in Papua New Guinea and, you know, they did a lot of amazing things and I wanted to tell the stories of these many amazing villages in Papua New Guinea and how they've become Baha'is and the wonderful souls that live there. And it's so hard because I'm, I remember a lot of these things, but then I mix a lot of the stuff and I, you know, it's not, you know, sometimes like the way you tell a story, you can embellish certain things, but it's really hard to, and you know, it's not like I can just email someone in a village in Papua New Guinea where there's no electricity or anything. They don't even have internet, but that's interesting. And I, I think you see that with a lot of Uh, Baha'i books like that where they're a little bit dry but at the same time I think yeah maybe the way to go for these is to make movies about these to kind of you know capture people's attention no that's interesting because the, the first book about anyone needs to have all the facts straight you right write another book about George Townsend that kind of just gets to the juicy bits as long right. as this one exists that has right. everything you know, every piece of correspondence he ever wrote in it you know and his shopping lists but yeah well we should uh, we should wrap this up I think people are thanks Rain um, yeah start to I think that was great our voices but um, thank you uh, Nason it was great chatting with you thank you Rain interviewing each other and <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone fun. for listening in to this first ever test run at the Baha'i blog cast. We just downloaded the software yesterday and got it all set up and Nason got me a nice microphone here for my laptop and um, I think we're off and running. Cool. Thanks, Rain, for doing that and um, yeah, please, uh, I hope everyone likes it. Please send us some emails at editor at Baha'i.net if you've got questions or topics you want to It's talk Baha about. Baha'i.net or Baha'i blog.net? 
sorry, uh, editor at Baha'iBlog.net. Thanks, Thanks Rain. You. There's a reason you're here. <laughs> and um, yeah, send us questions. We're going to try and do uh, a regular podcast called the Baha'i Blogcast. And Rain is going to host uh, a number of them at the beginning. Yeah. So sure. thanks so much, Rain, for agreeing to do that. And we hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much. And good night. Good night.